Hello, welcome to Podcast 27, where I'm joined by Mr Paddy Maloney, who is the subject of this Jamie Boyle book, The Altar Boy. We've been inundated with questions for Paddy, so I'm going to get straight into questions, if that's all right with you, Paddy. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. yeah. Okay. Paddy, you've got this book out with Jamie Boyle. Uh, what is this book about? Um, um... The book, The Altar Boy, it's all about my life story. Oh, okay. It's from my earliest memories being six, seven year old, living in Cannon Street to the present day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you grew up in Middlesbrough? Yeah, Middlesbrough, yeah. yeah. Was that like an odd place to grow up? Yeah, I, I suppose every every place has, it, has its uh, thing. But yeah, Middlesbrough was tough, it was tough, you know, the steelworks were down there. Yeah, it was hard growing up there. But as, as a kid, you're all the same, aren't you? Well, every, all your neighbours are the same, everyone's the same. So you don't realise how tough it is till you look back. Why do you think in the North East that there's a lot of hard men? Uh, there seems to be, um, from what I can see, there's quite a, a lot of tough people up that end. Yeah, yeah. It's... The proper people, it's, it's, it's you know... I mean, probably someone from Manchester watching this thing, like, we know it's different. But, uh, no, it, it, the was a, it was a small town, it was only a small town, but it's, it's notorious, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's notorious. For hard people and for things like that, yeah. I like us. We saw you on the Sean Atwood podcast yeah. talking about how you uh, you've turned your life around. Do you yeah. were, do you regret much of what you've done in your life? I regret most of what I've done in my life. You know, like I say, when I've read the book myself, it brings back like the things that I that I have done that I shouldn't have done. But you know, yeah, I can't change it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't change it. You know, it's my past. You know, and I, and there's nothing I can do about it. You know, I talk about it. Sometimes it's hard to talk about it. You know, like I feel a bit nervous now, but I'm okay. We just, you know, yeah, yeah. everything's fine. So living the life of crime, do you, do you, are you constantly looking over your shoulder and stuff like that? I'm not now. In, in the in the back day, in, back in the day, you did, yeah. What whatever sort of criminality you were into, you're always looking over your shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like you know, like now, you know, it's like I say, it's against in my past. I've got nothing to fear. Yeah. yeah. And I've been quite truthful. So you was an altar boy, and it, uh, obviously you was an altar boy, yeah. hence the title of the book. Yeah, yeah. So do you want to do you want to talk us from where you got from being an altar boy to ending up in the life of? It's just right. I, I think I think you, you, your path's drawn out for you, isn't it? In life sometimes, you know, nothing wrong with council states, but that's all I've ever lived on. So you're mingling with people on your level, and there's always some sort of criminality going on, and you want to get out of it. You want to try and better yourself. You know, I have worked, I, I, I've, you know, I've had quite a few jobs. Uh, but as I got older, you're looking for the easy money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I started working on the doors at 17, 18. You know, it was just a daft job, like, you know. Sometimes I got, when I was in my day, you got five pounds a night, ten pounds a night if you were lucky. And that's like where, where things started to go wrong. Yeah. You know. But everything I've done and everything that's in the book, it's all down to my own fault, you know, it's, I'm not blaming anyone. You know, it, all, all of our criminalities and whatever, whatever you're going to ask me about, it's all down to myself. So do you believe in fate? Do you think it was all mapped out, that, this, this journey, what you've took? Yeah, I believe in fate. Yeah, I believe in fate. I mean, I'm still here to talk about it, you know what I mean? There's plenty of people, my friends who aren't here no more, who, who would love to be here, but they're not. So I, I think it's just my life. When I started writing the book, Jimmy, it was just like for me, not for any, not for anything else. I just thought, you know, started writing it and I'd put it down and forget about it. But as I got into the into the criminality part, I realised how how deep I'd got. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because uh, my, my first early days, you know, you, you're running about nightclubs. Everyone was about nightclubs, taking a bit of bit of speed, having a bit of blow, you know, things like that, and. Uh, be, it was part of my youth growing up, and I—I I mean, I wasn't a massive drug taker, you know. What I mean, I might have had a little dab of whiz now and then. I didn't smoke, no. didn't smoke cigarettes, so it didn't bother me. But as as you slowly you mingle in them circles, and then you, your next step is, you know, I, I was working on drugs. I become, I become a drug dealer. I was selling five pound deals of Rocky and, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that, you know. And you, I didn't realise how how bad it was and how wrong it was at the time because it didn't seem wrong. At the time, it didn't seem wrong. Was a lot of people doing it? Was it like was it like the world, the circles you was moving in that it was just the norm? Yeah, well, back in my days, it was mainly the, like 
the Jamaicans that sold it, you know what I mean? White lads didn't really sell drugs them days. You're all right, yeah. You know, so like, and I eventually watched on the doors and that. I just started selling. So there wasn't ma there wasn't many white people selling drugs. Would you want to? Not you, you know. All right, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. going back a long time. I mean, I'm 21, but you know, going on 63. And you, 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 look, you look very. You've got good skin, if you don't mind me saying. Yeah. Is, that, is that is that like for you not drinking, or is it oil of you? Like, is, 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 is it? Is it? Yeah. When I, when I get a shower, I, I use conditioner on my face. Fair play to you. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So did your um, your journey then? Did it did it take you into custodial sentences? Did you, did yeah, you get yeah. brushes with the law? I mean, going back to my youth again. I mean, when I was fifteen, I ended up getting Boston. I went to Boston. Oh yeah, 15, right. yeah. Boston is a terrible place. You know, uh, fifteen I got Boston. I done about altogether about fourteen months, fifteen months. What was um, was Boston a lot harsher then than it is now? Is, 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 no is not well, the, I don't think so. The young offenders, is young it? offenders now. Mm. Yeah, Boston was it was quite strict. Was it kind of a sharp, sharp shock? Was, was it like military style kind of? No, it was a long shock because you ended up like I think I, my first one I done about forty or fifteen months in Boston. Okay, but it's not Boston. But Boston's like going to a very strict boarding school because you have to go you still at school okay so you go to boston you have to go to school oh right so the school there as yeah, well you, you have to do your education and your pe and stuff like that they're very strict but getting to boston that was the hardest part because a 15 year old when i got my first boston i ended up in durham jail at 15. well mm. what was the what was the offense for that was from the first boston go, going to for theft Theft, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going to put the theft on an awesome cart. All right, yeah. And a pair of ball cutters. You, oh, you used to, you used to scrap, didn't you? Yeah, yeah we used to go like scrap, business, scrap, yeah, yeah. And eventually got caught and with ball cutters on the thing. And we used to pin scrap off railway yeah. lines when we were. That's where they got most of ours from. Yeah, yeah. it was only wheelbarrows full and things like yeah. that. But we thought we were millionaires. Yeah. You got they yeah. just, just rip you off at scrap yard. You get you take you'd, you'd uh, knock your pan out taking an yeah. hundred weight of iron in the scrap. Yeah. But, and they'd see you coming and just give yeah. you a couple of quid. But similar, similar to what we yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I got Boston for that. So, but then I had to go to Durham first. So I spent about six to seven weeks in Durham jail. And that's when that, that's where that Paul Sykes was in. That's how far I'm going back. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. Paul Sykes was in jail. You actually got to see Paul Sykes, yeah. I'm going back a long time, yeah. He, yeah, he was there and I did see him, but I can't really remember. Yeah, yeah, so it was, he had never on. had any interaction. There was a lot of talk about him while Sykes was on the wing and that. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. So then, you, then you're in Durham for six, seven weeks, but then you get to go up in Durham, you go to Strangeways. It's an allocation centre for Boston's, so they used to take you there, allocate you. So I, I'm, I've probably been in two jails for about four or five months before I even got to Boston. And this was just for scrap? This is, yeah. So you you must have pinched a lot of scrap, or... No. Was no. it not a lot? Was it, was it just something no. they made an it's example just, of? Yeah, you? yeah, yeah, just... You got Boston, you got Boston. Uh, so like I say, I got released from that Boston, got out and... I think I was out about six weeks and I got another Boston straight after. Was it very like, um, uh, kind of, I'm trying to find the words here, do you know, Boston, like, is it like sink or swim and you, you know, very hard and if it, if it showed weakness and all that, did, um, did yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah lots of bullies in there, did, yeah. you did you boxing come in handy in Boston? Did you have any like scraps? I had, a, yeah, I had two fights with the same lad, yeah, he battled me twice, yeah. Really, yeah? Yeah, Scouse kid, yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So from from Boston, where, where did that take you? On your Got out of Boston. Uh, life moves on, doesn't it? I, I tried to. Uh, I got a job, started working, making my mum and dad proud, and then but you're still in the same, you're still in the same vicinity, you're still in the same little town. And uh, I went from that. I mean, I've done a few daft jail sentences, twelve months, eighteen months, for, for like. <laughs> For, for silly things for like yeah, fraud right, getting yeah. cars and hp and selling them and that okay yeah because there was no checks then did you could buy a car and hp and go and sell it and but was the thing as well you used to be in money from crime that, that a normal job doesn't really pay uh would you would you did you have any kind of like formal skills like uh no would you just like no. that's one of my regrets i wish i'd done a trade yeah i wish i'd learned something but i, I never yeah. you know that just that just went past me but then i moved on to where uh, you can say on the doors went on the doors and because you've been to Boston people talk about you because I was only young yeah on yeah the doors. I was only 17 18 19 and you come to Boston like young kids talk about you and that and then uh after me a few jail sentences I, I, I sound as though I, it might sound stupid to people watching but I seem to move up the ladder a little bit 
because we were selling about five pound deals and ten pound deals. I started going up to ounces and things like that. And uh, I had some friends who were, who were a lot bigger than me in the game. And my main problem started when I went. I used to go to Spain and I met I met a friend of mine in Spain, okay. John McCormick. Right. Uh, and and he was quite big over there, unbeknownst to me. I didn't know what he was doing, but I met him in Spain. We carried on our friendship type of thing, and uh, we became. He was a major drug dealer, international. But uh, I'd met him. I'd met him about four or five years before he, in Middlesbrough. And what had happened? I just got out of one of my jail sentences, and I was on my ass. I never got a penny. But people think you've got money. Yeah, yeah. So you had that like little. Did you have to kind of put on the front that you still had money? Yeah, right? yeah. With like you know paying the bills and putting the phone on the table, I couldn't do it. So I goes to see Johnny. He had a pub over Thornbury, called the Thornbury, and I went in this pub and I wasn't. It was a place I never really used. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I seen John. So it's his pub. So he shouts me over. Everything all right? And I need to have a crack with you. I need to have a chat with you. And so I, I had five minutes with him. What's the matter? I went on my ass, John. Type of thing. I'm on my hand, got a light. Can you give us a bit of graft? He went, what do you want? I went to Nam Bar. So he said, come back in an hour. I was back in an hour and he gave me a kilo. You know, just sort it when you want. And that's, we've become friends and that's when I sort of stepped up the ladder. Well, when you went to John McCormick, to that pub, to yeah. like get a Nam Bar, I'm not, I'm not asking for advice. I, yeah. well, how, how did, how, how hard is it to build up around? For, was there a, was the demand there? Did you was you well connected? You had a network of people, or did you have to go start from scratch and build up a lot? It's like building up a small business in a way, isn't it? It's yeah, called. yeah. No, it, it wasn't that. It wasn't difficult. Like I said early on, so being sixteen to seventeen, I was selling drugs in a small amount. So, so everyone gets to know you. I had a bit of a reputation for that sort of thing. So no, it didn't take long for me to build it back up. You know, right. and so like I've got the kilo off John, and that's that really put me back on my feet, really helped me out. You know, so I carried on from there. John disappeared. He, he left uh, Middlesbrough. Uh, there was some some controversy over a massive drugs haul uh, that had been caught, and John ran away and stayed like to Spain. So you now he's living in Spain. So I've lost all touch with John, but I'm still carrying on my little drug dealing thing in Middlesbrough. Yeah, when I say drug dealer, it's just a marijuana. Uh, so I, I, I work with other people, I work with family, I work with other friends, and uh, I'm, I'm doing okay, I'm doing okay. I keep everything away from my family, my wife and kids. I treat it as a job. You know, I don't go home and talk about it, I don't. I don't buy flash cars or nothing like that. Uh, and I'm going on holiday, so we've got, we booked for Spain. So we go to Spain, me, Debbie and, and the kids, and... Uh, the old Uda Bumindo, John McCormick. All oh, right. Yeah. I met him in Spain, and uh, the matter completely changed. He was absolutely uh, massive. I later found out. Now uh, we have a conversation, and uh, we go for a meal on the night time. I'm only there for two weeks, so I spend a couple of days with him, and we're catching up. And uh, it's time to go home. And uh, he, uh, what the call it? He, he asked me if I had any money to spare. Because he was having a few problems, cash flow problems. So you think, oh God, no, I'm going to have to lend him some money here. Because he'd done me that massive favour, yeah. got me on my feet. So uh, I left him two grand. I thought I'd never see it again. And he made these promises to me. Like saying, like, you know, I'll sort you out, pay you back, this will happen, that'll happen. Goes home and I never really thought no more about it. About three, four weeks later, I got a phone call off John. Do you fancy flying over? You need, need to see you. So I flies over on my own, has a meeting with John, he explains what his business is all about, how big he is and that, and he invites me on board. Uh, it was quite quite a lot to take in, it was quite, it was one of them like requests where I've sat and thought about it and yeah, you jump at it with two hands, and, but then when I was on my own in the hotel room, I was thinking to myself, what am I doing here? What am I doing? Because uh, he was he was going to be sending me like 200 kilo of Rocky home every month. Yeah. So like, yeah, I was excited, but I was also nervous as well, because it's a lot. Next level. Yeah, it's a next level. I wasn't used to it, and I didn't know if I was capable. You know, so I, I, it comes home, and it arrives, and I start, and, and I'm, I'm doing okay. How did they get it over? Yeah. Yeah, they, they wouldn't tell me that. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, that was the, I, on a, on a need-to-know on a need -to -know basis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just get a phone call and say, it's in a van at so-and-so. Something that I travel for, something that happens to be on my doorstep. So... 
I mean, it wouldn't just be sending me 200 home, we'd be sending all around the country. Right. So I'd get about 200, and, and I, had, I had customers, I had four or five customers, and I just used them. And it was, I, I was under the radar, you know, I was under the radar, because I, I wasn't driving about, I wasn't dropping gear off to anyone. Yeah, yeah. I had customers, and I was happy. Yeah. And, they, and, you know, it went on like that, and we'd become really good friends. Obviously, because I was making him money, and he was making me money, you know. And there. Uh, I started spending a lot of time in Spain. I mean, I was over there four or five months of the year. I stayed there. I was always, always staying in the hotel on my own. I'd never stay with John. And uh, we built this relationship up. And uh, it got to the stage where I was getting introduced to more people and more people. And you become part of their syndicate thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. And when you want to get out, it's not that easy to walk away. You know, yeah. I'm not saying that anyone threatened me because they didn't. And I'm not making excuses to say that I stayed in because of that. It's just that when you want to leave and you think, I've had enough of this, the pressure's getting to me. Because there was a lot of pressure. Was you looking over your shoulder all the time? Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. It's, 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 I mean, then you get you get paranoid. You know, your, your family life takes a, a back seat. You know, I, I was neglecting my wife, I was neglecting my kids, my family and that. So it's like, it was like a full, it's like a full-time job, wasn't it? Like, yeah. Was it 24 hours a day job? Yeah, right? and I was away from home four or five months of the year, maybe six months of the year. All right, yeah. I was staying in Spain. So I put a lot of pressure on my relationship with Debbie. So I, I eventually started wanting to, like, get out of it slowly and slowly. And uh, I found it difficult. Partly because I was used to the money. Yeah. And partly because... And you developed a lavish lifestyle around... The, uh, oh. Sort of, yeah. I mean, I was living above my means, yeah. Yeah, but then it all it all came crashing down. Uh, uh, what it was, uh, he he got in partnership with some other people. Uh, there was a man called Irish Brian. I don't know his second name. Uh, he was a bit of a uh, he was a bit of a nuisance actually, but he was he was well connected, and uh, he became John's partner. And so like I'm over there one day, and uh, I'm sat in a bar talking to John. And uh, out of the 200k, I've got 30 kilo left. And uh, John said, can you get rid of it? I went, no, because I've my five customers have took. They're happy. I'm not running about Middlesbrough or the North East trying to sell the other 30. Just add it on to the next one and it'll go. He was happy with that. Irish Brian wasn't. So he started whinging and uh, tried to put pressure on me to sell it. And I was having none of it. I said, no, I, you know, just leave it. I'm not, I'm not going up to do it. And we, there were some friends there from Middlesbrough, another group of drug dealers. Uh, and they sat at the next table, obviously, over there had our conversation. And uh, he's a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, actually. Uh, and he chirps in, Paddy, I'll do that for you. I can sell that for you. So I'm like, right. Yeah, and looks at John, John, when you get home, give him it. Like, well, no, it's mine. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. not going to give him it. Yeah. But I had to in the end, so I gives him it. And uh, my very good friend, Done one with it, didn't pay for it. Yeah. Like, so it's gone missing. So, John, an Irish band, on the phone to me 24 7. You know, have you seen him? Can you get hold of him? Can you get the gear back? Can you get the money? And he'd, st he'd to phone me every day for about three, four weeks. And every conversation was getting worse and more threatening. So, the, the, the onus was on you now to, yeah, to, to, to retrieve out. what they'd give away when yeah, I was yeah. So, it brought a lot of pressure to me. Because I didn't know where he was, and he wasn't going to give me it anyway. He'd done it in, whatever he'd done, he'd done. And each phone call I got off John and Brian was getting more threatening and more threatening. And then I started phoning my father-in-law and things like that, because he, he worked in the social club, and he, had his, he was a secretary in there, he had his number. So it was getting to the stage where they were threatening and threatening me. I was like, fucking hell. But oh. you, you made John start turning on you like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand why. So in, in the end, it was like, you know, like, do what you're going to do. I can't do fuck all about it. I haven't got your money. I didn't give him it. You, but I, th I think they, I think they were both on, on the gear over there. I think they were both on a bit, taking a bit of crack. So they were like, sometimes they'd be okay on the phone. Either. Sometimes they'd be irate. Cut long story short, I'm in the house one night and uh, I'm just chilling out. And an old pal of mine from Spain, who used to go to Spain to see John and to see me, his mum lived next door to me, so he knocks on the door, and I'm 
five places, same man. Are we in? I'm not taking no notice of him or anything. So I, I walked in, he's walking behind me. Sat down, do you want a coffee and that? And he's like, no, no, no. And he's got like a few tears in his eyes. He's not crying, but he's got a few tears in his eyes. And I can say there's something wrong. What's the matter? And he went, I'm really, really sorry, mate. And I'm like, fucking, I'm confused now. I'm going, what's going on? He went, they're outside, mate. Man, who's outside? I mean, Irish Brian and John. Not John McCormick, another man called John. Okay. Another Irish fella, two Irish fellas. I'm like, you fucking, I'm gonna laugh on you. You've brought them to my house. And in the commotion, my wife's screaming because she's passing the kids upstairs getting ready for bed. And Irish Brian's leaned over the car, waving at her with a gun in his hand. I'm like, fucking, and then the lad seemed to disappear into thin air. I don't know where he went, and I'm like on the front, and they've pulled away. So your mate had betrayed you? You just, just showed him where you lived in? Yeah. yeah. Do you know, to, to, to give him his joke, he never betrayed me because they knew, they knew who he was and they knew that his mum lived next door to me. So it was quite difficult for him to say, no, I don't know where he lives because his mum lived next door to me. So, and we like sort of grew up together. So the next thing you know, there's army response everywhere. Like, and they've sort of like, they, they put a place for outside my house for my protection and things like that. And uh, I'm still phoning Johnny Spain saying, what are you fucking playing at? And he goes out my hands, but he's, he's on one. Just give him the money. And I can't, because I haven't got it. Mm. So I phones my pal who has got it, who has took it. And he comes home and, because they couldn't kill him as well, not just me, they couldn't kill the both of us. And uh, before you knew it, they must have gone to a party in, in the, we had used to have blues parties in Middlesbrough, run by the Jamaicans. Okay. And uh, they must have been in one of these parties. The lad from next door to me, and these two Irish fellas, and they must have been talking about me. Like saying they no drunk on drugs. They're gonna to come to come to kill Paddy Maloney and Paul and Paul Bryan. So the next thing you know, there's a police van on my front and I'm go, going over the door like it's morning pad, everything being alright. I'm like fucking hell, what's going on? So I sent my wife away, she went to, uh, to my nephew's to my sister's house in Arrogate. My wife and kids went to stay there. Because it got quite serious. You know, they were trying to kill me. And uh it's difficult to talk about because it's uh so I'm on my own in my house and my brothers have come over and you know we're not gangsters we're just normal kids you know what I mean we're just normal lads it's, I'm out of my league and uh I mean my other friend who was involved in it who did lose the gear he's brought guns over and and uh what they call them crossbows and stuff like that and i'm like sat in the house and oh, what the fuck's going on here like a film uh, yeah, yeah yeah and i've and i've sat on and we sat in the, the messing about with guns and that and, and i'm like thinking what the fuck's going on here what are they, you know we're going to kill someone or someone's going to kill us yeah and it seemed that last forever it seemed that last for like for weeks and weeks and last for about four or five days and then it all seemed to die down as quick as it started it died down and they went back to ireland and spain but that was a part of my life what's in the book which was like fucking did hell. they just give up then after a while that they didn't get the money or did you did you kind of like get the money from somewhere or no no i never ever paid them and you know i, I didn't feel no guilt <coughs> because i knew that i didn't know the money if i owed the money and i had the gear away then yeah i would have like tried to sort it but it wasn't my fault so later so i i get out of the drug game i have to get out of it because it's just destroying my family so i get out of it and uh I'm, we, we get a pub, me and my wife get a pub, we have a pub called the Half Penny, and we're happy as Larry, you know, drugs have gone, everything's disappeared, okay. and, I'm, and I'm working all the hours God sends, to make a living for my family and that, mm. and uh, it, it happens, uh, my friend who owed him the money is in Amsterdam, on holiday in Amsterdam, for a weekend, the last weekend away, and uh, he walks into this pub, there's a lot more to it, he walks into this pub, and unbeknown to him, it's John McCormick's pub. So next thing he goes in and like the doors are shut, the lockers, and then John's got him. He's got him in, in the pub. And uh, John phoned me, called, gave him my phone number. And he phoned me at the pub and he went, Are you pad? It's John. I said, All right. What do you want? He went, I've got your mate here. He's blaming you. He said, You had the gear away. And I went, I don't give a fuck what he's saying, mate. I put the phone down. But I'm, you know, I never put the phone down. And then about four weeks later, uh, Paul turned up. They had him, he said they were going to shoot me, Paddy. Went, there was this couple of lads there, took me in the back room and like making a few phone calls to come and move the body. He said, I was fucking sat there and he's making a phone call to get rid of my body. He went, so uh, in a split second, he said, I just looked at the window, he said, I just ran and just died through the window. Landed on the, on the main road, fucking 
got hit by a car, ran down the road, the police picked him up and sent him home, deported him, got him back home. So that's how serious it was. I'm thinking, then John phoned me and said, Do you fancy coming over? We need to talk. I went, No, I'm not coming over, mate. Like, he kept phoning me and phoning me. And then I got a phone call once and he went, Paddy, can I come and see you then? So I said, A few phone calls. I said, Yeah. And he came to the pub to see me. And uh, we had a discussion. I had all my paperwork in order. Like, and at the end of the day, he owed me 30 grand. Not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And we worked it out because I hadn't. I had had my wages off the 200k type of thing. So we sat and, it sounds stupid, but he had a, he had a little, he had a little cry and give me a cuddle and it was all over with. So that, that was... That was a death threat finished, yeah. And we, and we stayed friends, we stayed friends because, as that as it sounds, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I, I, I got on really well with Johnny, got on really well with me. I think it was the drugs that got hold of him and, and turned him as well as Irish Brian. But he's dead now, he got, he got shot in Denmark. Oh, right. What happened to Irish Brian? Did he just go off the scene or...? No, he got shot in Mias and put in the car and set on fire. Shit. In Mias. He's, so they're both dead. I have nothing to do with me in here. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, no. But Irish Brian got killed in Spain. Yeah. And John got shot in Denmark. So you was in a pub at this... Was you still in your pub at this time? Yeah, we've had pubs ever since then. We, we stayed in the Halfpenny for... I was there about 14, 15 years. It was on the estate where I grew up. Absolutely lovely little pub. Uh, then we went to live in Spain, me and the wife. Nothing to do with drugs or anything. Uh, for about a year, two years. We were struggling to make ends meet. She was in hairdressing. Where about in Spain, was you? Uh, at first we were in Fungarola. Okay. Yeah. But Debbie was working. She had a little salon. And I was doing the fags from Gibraltar. Oh, yeah. So, we were okay. But getting the kids into school and that. And we started to struggle a little bit. We got a mortgage over there and, and we were like struggling to pay the mortgage with all the other bills. So we got the offer of a social club in Middlebeck. So we put in for it and we got the, we got the club. So we come home, the club had accommodation, so we lived upstairs in the club and uh, we were there for 14 years. We just we only left last November. But uh, so I, I haven't done drugs for a long time now. Yeah. You know, I still know the people and people still know me and I'm still classed as a drug dealer type of thing. But I'm not doing it. It's no glamorous laugh then, like see, like, see in rap videos, no, the, the no, drug dealer, is, is yeah. it just mither and, and stress and worry and... Yeah, of course it is, yeah, you, 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 you can't trust anyone, you don't trust... Did can't. you ever get taxed at all, whether it be like, anything like that, no? No, I mean, you had, you had, the, you had Lee Duffy on the scene, uh, he was phenomenal, he was, he was, young kid was a monster. Did you know him, did you know Lee Duffy? Yeah, I knew Lee Duffy really well, yeah, he was best friends with my brother-in-law, uh, Dale Anderson. And I think that's the only reason I never ever got taxed because he was close to my family. Yeah. But Lee was a monster, you know. If you had something and he wanted it, he'd just take it. There was nothing you could do. Yeah. You know what I, mean? I mean, I was in that league where you could shoot him because that, that wasn't me. Well, he's just like a legend up your way into. Yeah, of course he was, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he was only a kid when he died, he was only 26. But I knew him when he was 21, 19, 20, 21, 27. So he was a monster. So he's just operational from 19 to. to yeah. Yeah. Till he got killed, yeah. Yeah. But um, no, no, I never actually got taxed, so I was quite lucky in that in that respect. But then, uh, so like I haven't done drugs now for a long time, fourteen and a half penny. Someone the phone you now and asked you to get get them something if you could, you would. Yeah, yeah. A favour. And then we moved into the Middlebeck Social Club, and I was there for a long, long time. And uh, I have a friend, old Jamie Boyd's doing a book on, uh, called Paul Bryan. He's uh, he's doing a double life sentence. Okay. And he phones me all the time. He phones me maybe twice a week from jail. Right. Because we're good friends. I was his best man. And uh, he says to me, uh, blah, blah, blah. I was talking to uh, Mick, uh, I forget his name now. A, a scouse could call Mike, Mick. He used, oh, he used to get gear off years ago. When I say years ago, I mean 35 years ago, 40 years ago. And I went, fucking hell. Is he all right? He went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've given him your phone number. I went, what have you given my fucking phone number for? Why have you given Mick, Mick Morgan? Why have you given Mick Morgan? My phone number. You know, because he asked for it. I was like, fucking hell. So you know what's coming next. About four weeks later, I've sat having my Sunday and the phone went. There's Mick Morgan. I haven't seen this kid for 40 years, so all I can remember with Mick Morgan as is a snot you know, little scouse kid. Yeah, yeah. And a red XR2. Okay. That's all I can remember him as. And that's the image I've got in my head. So he's talking away and he's telling me he's just finishing a 14. He said, I'm just finishing a 14 pad. You don't mind me phoning? No, I don't mind you phoning. Next couple of phone calls. I've got some uh, whiz there, can you get rid of it for us? I went, 
not really, Mick. I said, I don't know, Ivan. That's what Paul said. I said, not really. So a few weeks go by, and he's still phoning me. And uh, I know somebody who wants some. So I say, yeah, send it down as a favour. I take it off him and give it to him. And that's how I got back into it. Right. And I don't really... Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. It's wrong. All of my hands up. But I didn't class myself as a drug dealer. No. Someone give me a bag. Ten minutes later, someone else come and took the bag. He just passed it out. He gave me some money, he gave me some yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, it was just like a go between. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but I didn't realise how big Mick Morgan was. Right. He was partners with someone called Christopher Welsh, who was known as the Scouse Escobar. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he was in, they were both in jail together. And he was finishing 14, Chris Welsh was doing 16, yeah. Or he was doing 16, yeah, for drugs, but working from in jail. And uh, so, like, they're massive, they're supplying the whole of the country, Scotland, everywhere. I didn't know. I was just getting four kilos of them. I didn't know what they were it's up to. It's not a small time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they all slowly got caught. When they all got caught, every time the radio one of their safe houses, my, my phone number was there or my name in the debt list. So they just started looking into me and looking into me and eventually just thought we're going to pay him a visit. Come to the Middlebeck Club, I don't know, six o'clock in the morning, up was five in the morning. And that was it. I was nicked. Just on conspiracy. Never found with no drugs, never found with no... Just the number. Just because you had the number yeah. and you And I couldn't explain wh why. And there was three text messages on, on the phone that they found in prison from Christopher Welch to me. Yeah. And it was just conspiracy. It's unbelievable. Just... What, what, does, what was the charge? Mm -hmm. what, what was the... How many years did you get for that? Uh, I'm still on licence now. I've got five and a half years. Shit. Yeah. Like, it was like... I was... 58, 59 years old, I think fucking And that came out of the blue, you, you had no inkling yeah, in no, that no, that was around the cards? No, no, I didn't, I'd, I'd stopped working with them, I, I'd finished, you know, yeah. the lad I was getting it for, we'd had, he'd give me a few complaints, so it, it just stopped, so I wasn't even working with them, it was like, I got arrested about six, seven months after them, they were all on remand. So in your previous incarnation as a drug dealer, you was, you was never on the radar with the police or anything like that, you was completely low-key and... I want to be, I'd have been on the radar, yeah, but they never had the technology in my yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, they have now. Yeah, of course. Do you know what I mean? It was all like, it was a footwork with the police that didn't have anything. That yeah, they had yeah. I, I mean, I'm going back to the early 70s, 80s. So, like, they didn't really know anything, but today, I mean, they're all clued up, aren't they? I mean, yeah. that conspiracy charge there, I hadn't been in jail for a long time, I hadn't been locked up for a long time, and I thought they have nothing at all on me because I haven't done anything. I found no paraphernalia, I found no drugs, no money, never even found a phone. So like I was thinking, but then was, as they're going through the thing, they have a machine. My wife said, because I was locked up, they were putting these phones in this machine. Phones that were broke, were backs off, no kids over phones. Yeah. They put them in the machine and all of a sudden they shout, yeah, I've found it, boss, this bloke. And then one of my kids' phones, the phone number they were looking for was in their phone number, Dad. Right. So they attributed that number to me and that number to them. And I got that copy five and a half, yeah, yeah. So where did you end up? What prison did you end up in then? Uh, well, I got I was in my trial was in Liverpool, so I ended up in Walton Jail for a while for a few months. Uh, it's it's a it's a bad old jail. It's a rough old jail, but I mean I you know I was fifty eight years old, so it, I didn't bother with anyone. I didn't cause no. Did, did you not? Did you not get in any? Did no, you, was no, no, you didn't get any either off anybody. Any, no, any asshole off people. No. Some of the lads who, who, who were on my kit on, on my trial, obviously. We all went to court together, so we, we sort of, ah, yeah. Oh, right, so you had a bit, you had a bit yeah. of like a backup kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, but no, I never got no problems. Uh, it's a massive jail one, it's absolutely massive. Once they've uh, Googled you, they know you're not a nonce or anything, because I'm from down north, yeah, east, yeah. the northeast. I was okay, so I stayed there for a while. Uh, then I, I went to a prison in Preston called Warmot. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I done most of my jail in there. And that, you know, you're there, you're there, not, not, nothing you can do about it. Yeah. It's, it's one of the worst places mm -hmm. you can ever be in jail. Jail's disgusting. What's it, I mean, I've never done jail mm -hmm. kind of thing, but mm -hmm. um, what was it like, you know, when, when initially when, the, well, you locked up 20, how many hours a day you locked up? Most jails now when you get, not remand jails, <coughs> most jails now are working jails, so you have to work in them. Okay. You have to get up and you have to go to work or you have to go to education. So you know yourself say half eight in the morning, nine in the morning, yeah, you got a sandwich, you didn't down. Half eleven, you're back in your slab for 10, 15 minutes, half an hour. Then take that, you're back in. You're locked up at half past five. In Wham, you're locked up at half past five till the next morning. Do you, you, have, a, do you have cellmates or do you have your own cells? How does that work? What's the Usually, crack? usually you're in a cell with someone else. Yeah, yeah. Two or three people. 
But then when you, when you get to where I'm at, you're going to wait on this for the single cell. Yeah. I was on a wait list for about eight months. And I got my own cell, which is like heaven. You know what I mean? Was no, it, no worse than sharing a cell with someone. You, you don't, don't you know. well, you don't know what they're, what they're in for, do you, kind of thing? Well, you can, it's, it's, I mean, these phones now, it's, I can just phone Alice and say, Google Jimmy O, see what he's in for. <laughs> and it's dead easy, do you know what I mean? So, like, yeah, they can know what you're in for. But, uh, it's, not, it's just sharing yeah, a cell, it's your personal space. Yeah, yeah, missing your family yeah. and your wife and stuff like no, that. The toilet, go to the toilet, you've got to do that in front of someone, you know a what bucket. I mean? Is it, is it an actual toilet or is it a bucket? Or is, am, I, am I glad to be back when in I, the When past? I first went to jail, when I was doing my bosses, it was a bucket that was in Durham and that. But now they have toilets in. I mean, my house is like a jail and I have a piss bucket in bed. Yeah. You shouldn't be saying this really, but you know what I mean? It's all preferred, really. Yeah. You'd probably be yeah. nasty if I went in jail in my fucking house, yeah. to be honest with you. But. So, so Wal Walton was... Um, a rough old place then yeah it wasn't a rough jail yeah but i mean yeah. there, there's some screws in there but all right they were proper proper you know proper men proper proper screws now but no matter what jail you go to you're in jail so all these kids that say it's, it's a piece of piss well i didn't find it a piece of piss i mean it destroyed me nearly it's hard it's dead hard yeah some people do it as a career don't they so it's, it's a badge of honor to some kids isn't it that they've been in jail kind of thing that they're um... yeah the young ones i mean they're only young, obviously, so they're carefree, and they're, not, they're not doing massive sentences. But, like, for me to get five and a half years at my age, that's the time of life. Yeah, yeah. It was hard, you know what I mean? And it was, my, my kids had all grown up. You missed five? Did you, was it first, did you do a straight five, or did you? No, I've done, I've done just under three. <coughs> right, yeah. But, uh, it's not that, it's my age, my, my kids were, like, 23 year old, 24. So they've got the, it's in, in the local papers, it's on the news. Yeah, yeah, It's all yeah. over Facebook, you know. When you was doing all right as a public, you know, like yeah, a, a landlord. Yeah. So like it's thing. people going like, nah, I told you he was still at it. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Things like that. So in my family suffered more than me. I was in jail. You know, you switch off in jail, you get your land there. You know, you think, can I get through this? I can, and you have to get through it. No choice have you, no, really, yeah. No, you've got to get through it. You see any bad stuff in there, like people getting stabbed up and yeah, beaten up of, and all it's that. It's a dangerous kind of, place, yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially with the young ones today. I mean, because, you know, all this, uh, what they call it, sort of drugs, what they call it, medication drugs and that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they'll sell us all for, for it, you know what I mean? Right? Yeah. That didn't bother me, I wasn't involved in that, so. But I used to watch and think, I've got kids your age and, you know, yeah, it's yeah. scary. Jail's a scary place. So, was that the first time you was in jail, apart from Boss? Was it, what, have you done a few jails? Yeah. Uh, was that I've the first I've done, uh, I've done a few jail sentences. If I haven't asked me for good extent, I've done a, a, t a two year eight, I've done an 18 month. All in all, spent in jail, I've spent about 10, 11 years in jail. Yeah, yeah. In my life, 10 years, which is wasted. But like when you're younger, them young Boston sentences, you, you, you get, the, you, you know, you don't get them years back, but you, you get your life back. But like, I've been quite lucky. Cause my family stood by me. Well, yeah. Debbie, Debbie's Debbie, your wife. Yeah. Oh yeah. How did yeah, you meet yeah. her? Where yeah. did you meet Debbie? In, the, in one of the pubs I worked on the door. Was oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been with. I mean, thirty odd years now. Me and Debbie. Oh, I was. My eldest son, Debbie, is thirty two. So, she's been a rock. You know, what I mean, I put her through some shit. Well, but she's always been. stuck by you when you're yeah, sad, yeah, never yeah, wavered, yeah. and stuff like that. No, like never. That. Yeah, I mean. My other senses, I, I wasn't like, they, they weren't bad, you know what I mean? Were they drug related? Uh, obviously you had the scrap metal thing when you was a kid. Oh, that was only a kid. No, I'd, the sentence before the, this five and a half year, it was like just under three years. That was for, uh, I, I got filled in. Like I had a fight in the, in the street, but it was on the main road. Right. I had a fight with a, with a lad from Middlesbrough called Darren Murray. Big, I mean, Mike Tyson's double. We had a fight and... Uh, the police come to break it up and he hit the bobby with an axe over the head. He was trying to hit me with the axe, but he hit the bobby over the head with the axe. So we both got locked up for the fray and I ended up getting jailed. So I, I got just under three years with that. And Debbie was pregnant with our carers. So it's just like when you read the book, you know, when you read the book, there's yeah, stories yeah. like that in it. And then people will go like, oh, fucking hell, is she? Is she? This is the book. It's a, I'll put a link to the book under this video kind of thing, the altar bar. Yeah. So. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's Debbie on the back there. That's that's when we were going to school. Yeah. And that's when I come out of jail this time. Yeah. I mean, but like, yeah, I, I always knew I was safe, you know, with Debbie. I mean, she never missed a visit even when I was in Walton and Walmart. She, I was in Walmart like 18 months and she'd come up every fortnight. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, nephew Mike used to come up with her. It's, it's a gift. It's a blessing that you can meet someone and stay with them. This, yeah. this day and age, 
Yeah. People just delete people off Facebook and go yeah. and find somebody else, don't yeah. they? But <coughs> I was quite lucky. I have been lucky, she knows it. So what what was um, this is this is off the, the crime path, but yeah. so what's the secret of is it just have there been rough times where you've nearly called it a day kind of thing? Where you yeah, work, you better believe it, yeah. You just have to work yeah. at it in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've uh, yeah, a couple of times we've, we've been close to it. Yeah. But uh Yeah. It's 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 that's part of my life, whether you're a drug dealer or whether you work at ICI, you had you know. And yeah. Like the Morrison's, it, everyone has problems, but we seem to. Uh, I think my last jail sentence was harder for her and the kids. Than yeah, me. yeah, yeah. I'm in jail, and I'm was she left away. with no? Was she left with no money? Kind of thing. Well, she, she was no. She still had to run the club on her oh, own. Oh right, okay, yeah. So she was like running the social club on her own, which was like the social club was struggling. You know what I mean? Clubs are struggling now, so she was robbing Peter to pay Paul, and it wasn't making no money. So she was like doing her hairdressing on the side and stuff like that. But like, you know, it was costing her to keep me in jail. She used to have to send me thirty pound a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's people who, who don't who've never been to jail or don't know any sort of criminal type of thing. Think you go to jail and you get a like you know, a, a nice life, you don't. That thirty pound was for my toilet days, for my telephone, for my television. You have to pay for your television. You don't they don't right. give you one. Okay. You have to pay for it weekly. And if you don't pay, you don't get a telly in your cell. So like it was costing her thirty quid. So I don't know she was struggling, so that was hard. And what time, what, what decade is this? That was this, this is just uh, 2018. All oh, right, so it's I've just finished, yeah. Oh, I'm shit. still on license now. Oh, shit, right. Yeah, I'm still on license now. Right. Pardon me, yeah. Right. So, and then when I ended up from, from Wyoming, I went to Kirk Leverton, which is a, a cap D jail. And uh, after about six, seven months there, I got a job. I was waiting in a car wash, and then I was pot washing in a, in a hotel, so I got paid. But the jail take forty percent of your wage, so then I could like help support Debbie. So they let you they, they let you out to do, do to do work, and you come back in the prison. Am I right yeah, in thinking yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I th you know you have to be there a while, like so. Like when I was doing the car wash, that was in the that was in the prison grounds. Okay. Like you come get your car wash. All right. Yeah. So you get a bit of a wage there, so you can buy your own toilet, isn't that? So I didn't have to depend on Debbie then. And then when I uh, when I got the job in the in the restaurant. Uh, Chadwick's at Malby, lovely restaurant. Uh, I was pot washing in there, and uh, I got a wage. I think I was picking maybe 120 quid a week up. Right. I would have been picking more up, but the prison take 40 percent. So I could give Debbie money now. So that, that was a massive relief. Of course. You know, because there was no money. I had no money put away or anything like that. You know what I mean? Do you, re do you regret like um, the, 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 you know over your life doing that all that carry on? <laughs> Yeah, a lot of money went through your hands. Would you yeah, say, yeah, I've had so. lots of money through my hands and I've wasted it. You know, you know, I, I, you know. I mean, yeah, I've, I, I lived. I, I've had some really, really good times, and I've had some really bad times. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and, that, and that's the, 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 that's the life I chose. You know, whether it be right or wrong. It's kind of hard though when you when you're working class and you've not got a trade behind you, kind of thing. And yeah, I suppose yeah. once you taste that money. Why, yeah. why would you go and work 40 hours a week for 200 mm. quid kind of thing so yeah. people people kind of yeah. get trapped into that lifestyle don't they it's like you get become a slave to it in a, in a yeah. sense that you know yeah. and the criminal world from where i can gather it's feast of famine yeah. you have periods where you've loads of money then you have lean yeah. times and stuff like that but you, but you know like i'm not making excuses back in the day when i was a drug dealer the drugs were they weren't they weren't harsh drugs you know like nowadays you've got crack cocaine and all that stuff heroin it's all very addictive <coughs> marijuana and a bit of whiz to me was was i know people are gonna have to like say like he's talking shit but, but they were quite harmless yeah yeah, I mean, yeah cannabis is like legal in most countries i mean i mean but even the cannabis now they, they, they've, they've crossed all the strains yeah. and things so you've yeah. got super skunk and it's, it's knocking yeah. people off the reds but i suppose that it was, it, was, it was a different it was a different yeah. game then yeah. when it was it was all rocky black yeah like skunk. yeah there's all that soft blacky putty stuff and yeah yeah they're so bars from spain and that yeah yeah but like i'm not being excuses I, I mean i've never dealt in crack cocaine or anything like that but you know everything comes to an end and and everything i've done wrong i've paid for yeah yeah i've never been like one of them people that got away with it really so were, they, were some of these people like they're not really bothered it, it is really is you, you kind of regret what's gone on and you yeah, regret, you good, regret yeah. the time in prison and stuff like that yeah because when, when you're in prison like i say you were there you've got to get on with it it's the people that you leave behind that suffer yeah yeah you know like even when i was in boston i must have broke my mum and dad's heart yeah yeah like yeah. 15 year old yeah 
Well, you don't think at the time, do no, you? No, you don't think you at the know. time, you know. But like when, when I look back now and I look at, read the book or I'll watch the podcast or I'll go and watch your podcast with you now and think... I'm glad somebody that. watches it, nobody watches yeah. it. No, so thank like, you very much. Yeah. I know one, I've not got one viewer on it, yeah. but thank you very but much like, for that, man. Like life's strange, isn't it? And yeah. it, you know, it takes you where it takes you. And uh, I'm done now. But yeah. um, Jamie Boyle says that this is the best book he's ever. Well, Jamie's wife says it, surely. Jamie doesn't read, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jamie mean? says this is the best book he's yeah. ever written. So how did the book come? How did the book come about? Did you always want to write, tell your story, or did? Oh, did Jamie got in touch with me on a court of jail uh, because I was lead off his era. And uh, he, he said to me, blah, blah, can you do a few things on Lee Duffy? Can you tell me a few things? And uh, I was like, well, you know, so he comes to see me, we have a little bit of a chat. And I said to Jamie, I've been writing a book, you know. Oh, yeah. you, started, you, you started writing your own story? Yeah, then, I've been yeah. writing it for years before I met oh, Jamie. Okay, right, yeah. But never got round, I would never have published it. Yeah. It was just something that I was doing. And uh, Jamie, I said to Jamie, oh, I've been writing a book. And I looked at me, he was, I was like daft. And I oh, yeah, yeah. And like, shows a bit then. So I shows him a bit. And he, he, he liked it. He went, yeah, well, I'll have a look at it. And then when I've done it, I mean, you've got to read the book because it's, so, it's so truthful. I will know, do. Like, um, and it's, it's, it's got some really funny parts in it. It's got some really sad parts in it. Yeah. It's got some parts that make your, your hair stand on end. But it's just... <coughs> if you laugh in it, you know no what I mean? It. It's no like I'm, I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't done anything. If any, any kids read it, you know what I mean? Like young lads and that. We're into the drugs now, mate. Just, just try and get out of it because you go nowhere but jail it, it's, it's only jail, a matter of when getting battered bit yeah. dying or you know yeah. it's you're going to end up in jail aren't you at the end of it or you're going to end up in, in serious trouble but like i say i enjoyed writing it i enjoyed reading it and i've made some good friends through the book. how long did it take to get to print uh i think it took us about 12 months well i suppose if you're taking it to account when you started writing it yeah. it took quite a while until yeah. you yeah. take that into account but yeah. Initial concept kind of thing. Yeah. Well, there it is. Um, that's the Alter Boy. We're going to put a link below this video so you can get your own copy. Paddy, uh, thank you for putting up with me. I don't see many people, but thank you for coming and seeing me. Right you know I mean? Thank right you very much. No problem. Um, thank Paddy you. Maloney. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Ta.